Hello and welcome to another episode of Second Hand Stories. This is a place where I tell you stories. What kind? Well, histories, mysteries and unbelievable stories. This episode is extremely special because it is the first sequel. Yes, we're doing a part 2 and this is the second part of the Indian ghost stories and folk tales. Now, just a quick disclaimer before we begin some of these stories are extremely gory so if you do not uh, enjoy that stuff then now would be a good time to switch this off but for those of you who do strap in and bon appetit Our story begins with Ratan. Ratan is a 10-year-old boy and he's making his way back home. He's late. The sun has set and the shadows are lengthening as he makes his way quickly back home. His parents had told him to get back home before sunset. They said that it wasn't safe. But Ratan had lost track of time as he played and now he was desperately trying to get home just quickly enough that his parents wouldn't yell at him as he's making his way back home he passes through this deserted stretch of land at the end of this is his neighborhood and safety but along this stretch on either side are fields these fields are empty and they sway as the breeze whistles through them now as ratan is walking suddenly he can hear footsteps the footsteps are slow and steady and they're coming from behind him ratan doesn't think too much of it and he keeps looking ahead and keeps quickly making his way through the stretch but as his pace quickens he can hear the footsteps quickening too in fact they're going faster than him they're gaining pace and suddenly he hears a voice it's not an indian voice it's the voice of a britisher the britisher is speaking in hindi and he asks ratan he says stop can you help me ratan glances behind him and he sees this disheveled britisher ratan turns around and now he sees that this man is wearing a coat that doesn't fit and he's got his head to an angle and he's got this fry smile on his face in his eyes ratan can see malice but he's frozen the man says come here but ratan can't move and then to his horror the man starts walking toward him the man then reaches into his coat pocket pulls something out and says look at this and as ratan's gaze falls onto the object in front of him ratan sees that the object is a shiny mirror this mirror is bordered by a golden frame and as ratan looks into it he can suddenly see the world fading in front of his eyes ratan's parents wait all evening for him but he doesn't return they eventually start looking for him but no one knows what happened to the 10 year old boy they go through the village they ask every single person they meet they ask them if they have seen a 10 year old boy after a lot of questioning finally one boy steps forward he's shaking and he says i saw ratan and then he just says two words he says mumiyai wala sahab 
and when he says these two words the parents know that they're never going to see their boy again now this story is set in the 19th and 20th century it was during these centuries that a rumor an urban legend had started to spread across the country it was during this time that the british raj was at its height and this urban legend spoke of the mumiai wala sahab now mumiai was this thick black substance it was used as a as a medicine and the people who had it they said that they could get vigor and vitality this mumiai was also used in alchemy people said that it could turn base metals into gold and silver and a lot of people felt that this was one of the main reasons why the british had had so much economic success now this mumiai was made by mixing shilajit with human matter now the urban legend said that the way to make the mumiai was to catch a person drill a hole into their head hang them upside down and roast them over a fire and wait for their life matter to fall out of them what was even creepier was the fact that people said that the best mumiai came from children that's how the urban legend had spread throughout the country and people started reporting these disheveled mumiai wala sahabs they would entrance young boys with some kind of trinket usually it was a mirror or a wand and then as soon as they had done that the boys would start following this man blindly he would then lead them to a wagon and take them off to a production center people said that these production centers were all across the country and you can imagine why for those two centuries young boys lived in fear of the momiai wala sahab in our next story we meet a man and we meet him at a point where he's extremely happy the reason for his happiness is because he has just bought a plot of land and the reason he's extremely happy with it is because this plot of land came extremely cheaply he saved a lot of money on this he can't believe how good a deal he's gotten this man lives in a small village in tamil nadu and the land that he has bought is next to the forest now a lot of people told him that he shouldn't construct anything on this land he shouldn't construct anything so close to the forest but the man waved it off when you get such a good deal you don't stop to think of superstition so he starts construction on this plot of land next to the forest He builds a beautiful house a house that he always wished and dreamed that he would have and then the first night that he moves in something very very odd happens the day went by without any incident but in the night right before dinner suddenly there's a soft knock on his door he wasn't expecting guests but It's a newly constructed house maybe the neighbors had come to pay a visit He opens the door and to his surprise he finds standing out a long lost friend It's a friend he hasn't met for a very very long time this friend of his used to stay in a village that's very very far away and there was no intention of this man coming over to visit him he has no idea how his friend has landed up there But what's even eerier is his friend is behaving extremely oddly. He keeps looking at him smiling, but he doesn't say a word. The man 
is happy but his happiness turns to suspicion as his friend continues to remain silent and smiling finally the friend steps away from the house and starts motioning him to follow the man is creeped out but he moves out of the house and he shuts the door behind him as soon as he shuts the door he sees his friend dissolving in front of his eyes and in his friend's place there is now a dark black cloud before he can run back inside his house the cloud has swept him up it drags him away and raises him feet into the air the cloud swirls him around in this terrifying tempest and the man is being tortured and he screams and then the cloud lets him fall to the ground his body is smashed as it hits the ground and then everything fades to dark the next morning two men are heading into the forest as they do they pass by the newly constructed house to their surprise they see that the door is ajar as they go towards the house they find something even more horrifying they find the crumpled body of this man with his face twisted in terror what this man had encountered was a spirit called kathu karapu kathu karapu is a tamil phrase which means black wind and it is a spirit that is found in tamil nadu it is a spirit that resides in the forest in untamed uninhabited places now the spirit tends to avoid human habitation and tends to avoid human beings but it will prey on anybody who makes the mistake of wandering into the forest and crossing paths with the spirit it will also harm anybody who strays too close to the forest or makes habitation too close to its territory people who encounter the kathu karapu say that the wind will pick them up it's a wind that can go against the breeze and it will pick them up and it will give them like these bruises all over their body and worse it can make you slip into a fateful and fatal coma so if you're ever in the woods in tamil nadu and you see a dark black cloud in front of you make sure that you turn around and head in the opposite direction Our next story takes place in Cherapunji. Cherapunji is the wettest place in India and it's situated in Meghalaya. Now in Cherapunji there is a beautiful waterfall. This waterfall is called Nokalikai and it's the tallest plunge that a waterfall makes in this country. The water leaps off the mountain and it falls for 1115 feet. where the water crashes back onto the earth it forms a pool and this pool is almost green in color now this green very nicely reflects the lush surroundings in which this waterfall is situated there's lots of trees there's lots of vegetation and thick forests it's a beautiful place and an extremely wonderful tourist attraction in meghalaya however when you go to this waterfall you will find a board by the tourism department that tells you a story of this waterfall and the story once you hear it or read it suddenly colors this beautiful waterfall into a place of immense tragedy so here's what the story is A long time ago there was a woman called Likai 
and she used to live in Meghalaya near this waterfall. Now she was married to a man. This man was a porter, and the two of them had a daughter. Now tragedy strikes in Likai's life, and her husband eventually passes away. Now life is extremely tough, and Likai takes up the job of her husband. She becomes a porter too. She spends her days doing her job, and whatever time is remaining, she rushes back home and she spends with her daughter. Now life is extremely hard, and the women in the village they tell Likai that it would be good for the daughter and for her if she remarried. So eventually, she finds a man and she gets married to him. However, this man. turns out to be extremely rotten this man is extremely jealous of likai's young daughter he's extremely jealous because he feels that likai spends too much time with her daughter and not enough time with him this jealousy slowly starts building up inside him and it would come out in one of the most horrific ways Likai had gone to work one day and when she comes back home she finds that her husband has prepared a meal for her. Now you can imagine where this is going. She inquires about her daughter. The husband says that the daughter is away playing in a neighbor's house. Likai is satisfied with the answer. she sits down finishes her meal and then she was in the habit of having a uh, pan betel nut and as she is cutting the betel nut she looks into the waste basket and she finds the fingers of a little girl she immediately realizes what's happened and she's horrified disgusted revulsed She doesn't know what to do. She gets up and runs out of the house and keeps running and keeps running until she reaches the waterfall. And there in sadness and anguish she jumps off. That's why the place is called No Kalikai. In Khasi it means the leap of Likai. And in the roar of the water as it races off the cliff sometimes you might also hear the cry of a mother For our next story, we're traveling through Madhya Pradesh. We meet this man who's in a car, and he's got a driver with him because he's going a long distance, and he's hired this driver to take him there. The driver is a local man, and the two of them are hurtling down the roads of MP. It's raining, and the wiper is making its rhythmic wiping swoosh. As they make their way through the roads eventually they come to a town called Chanderi they go through Chanderi and there's a long desolate road it goes straight ahead away from Chanderi fort as they make their way down this road they see that there is an archway in front of them this archway is impressive it's this huge monumental gateway that has been cut into the rock and as they are approaching this archway suddenly the man who has so far been reclining in his seat he sits up because in front of him at the archway he sees the figure of a man this man has got his arms and legs outstretched and he's standing in the middle of the road in the middle of this gateway now the man immediately turns to the driver and he says slow down slow down there's a man on the road but the driver does not listen in fact he speeds up now the man is frantic he says you're going to hit him in the 
bright glare of the headlights the man saw that whoever was on the road was wearing very odd clothes clothes that were out of place out of time and he shuts his eyes and he braces for impact but the car doesn't hit anybody there is no thud there is no sound all he can hear is the gentle whooshing of the wipers he turns around and he sees that the gateway is still behind him but there's no one standing in the middle of the road he turns to the driver and he says what was that and the driver says we just met the architect of kati ghati kati ghati is the name of this archway that is near chanderi and it's got a haunting story attached to it now what is the story of kati ghati well in the 15th century there was a sultan of malwa this man's name was ghiasuddin shah and the sultan of malwa one day decided that he was going to pay a visit to a province that was part of his territory the province of chanderi now the governor of chanderi was a man called jiman khan and when he hears that the sultan is going to come to visit he decides that he is going to do something impressive to impress the sultan he decides that he is going to build this archway he is going to cut the rock that was in between malwa and bundelkhand and he is going to make this gateway to welcome the king now there is very little time and this task is extremely massive so he canvasses for architects all across his region to come and see if they can do the job a lot of the architects cannot there is only one man who decides to take the job up and he takes it on one condition now this architect is extremely arrogant about his abilities and he says that he's willing to do the job but only and only if nobody supervises his work and no one comes to inspect it until it's finished he wants his work to be a surprise now jiman khan agrees to this condition and work begins and soon enough kati ghati is ready the architect proudly beckons jiman khan to come and see his work and as jiman khan comes there he is left in awe of what he is seeing this is an impressive impressive work of brilliant architecture it's 80 feet high it's 39 feet wide it's 192 feet in length but as he is observing it suddenly his happiness starts turning to concern because there's one very conspicuous thing that's missing from this gateway and that is a door there is no door on this archway and in fact the architect has not even made provisions for a hinge when he points this out to the architect instead of accepting his mistake the architect is filled with shame and he excuses himself from the gathering and he kills himself this archway was said to be haunted by the spirit of this architect and eventually to pacify the ghost they bring his mortal remains and bury him right next to his creation he still haunts this archway standing with his hands and legs outstretched at the gateway blocking it like a door fun fact chanderi and this kati ghati archway served as the climax for the movie's 3 so if it wasn't for um, the real ghost there's also a fictional one that you can find at this desolate gateway Our final story takes place in July of 
Now this story takes place in a small taluk in Karnataka called Pavgad. And it's a normal night. There's nothing remarkable about this night in July of 1983. However, in this particular house, a mother is feeling extremely anxious. She knows that the nights before this were unremarkable as well. She's sleeping next to her husband and beside them on a bamboo mat are her three kids. She has two boys and one girl. The girl is just three years old. And she constantly looks over to see if they're safe. They're tucked in and they're sleeping peacefully. She hopes that this night passes just as unremarkably as it's begun. Slowly, though she wants to be awake and vigilant, slowly, sleep starts lowering her eyelids. And then suddenly, there's a cry. The sound pierces her sleep and it triggers her maternal instinct. She knows that the cry was of her three-year-old daughter. She wakes up with a start and as her eyes adjust to the darkness, she frantically looks over and she sees that her two boys are fast asleep. But her hand starts patting the bamboo mat next to them. And her daughter is gone. The mat is still warm from where her daughter was just laying. She can hear that cry ringing in her ears and she lets out this terrifying scream. The scream wakes up her house. The boys wake up with a start. Her husband shoots up to wakefulness and she tells them that the girl is missing. They rouse the entire village and everyone begins looking. But try as they might, they can't find a trace of her. Come morning, there would be news. But it would be of the worst kind. They would find the girl's skull, her intestines and her frock mere meters away from the house. It was found in a field. The frock was in tatters and it lay in a pool of blood. Beside this carnage were paw prints. Immediately the police were called and they brought sniffer dogs. The sniffer dogs, they picked up a scent and they raced into the forest. The police went chasing after them. The dogs eventually led them to a cave. Now the opening of this cave had been walled up with bricks. There was nothing else to be found. There was no trace, there was no evidence, there was nothing. Now what was eerier about this story was that the girl wasn't the first victim. She was the fifth. The disappearances and killings had begun in April of 1983 and all of them had taken place in the same taluk of Paugad. Now these abductions and killings they had one thing in common there were eyewitnesses one mother had seen her daughter being snatched away and she said that the daughter had been taken by a large dog-like creature another lady in another part of the taluk had a three-year-old girl and she saw a big dog-like creature tried to snatch her daughter away. She had the presence of mind to race after it and fight it. The dog had let go of her daughter and turned its fury on her. She had a giant gash on her neck out of this furious attack. There was another girl who was taken from Paugad and the mother of this girl had felt something, an animal, trample on her feet before the daughter was taken. She had raised the alarm and her grandfather had woken up and chased after this thing into the forest. And when he went there, he found himself confronting a striped animal 
that was as tall as a donkey. The animal had turned around, looked at him before disappearing into the darkness. Now, these eyewitness reports and the paw prints led a lot of people to believe that the culprit was probably a hyena. Now, the dense jungles around Paugad had striped hyenas. And pretty soon, shikaris and enthusiastic villagers raced into the forests with guns and knives and eventually they would bring back two dead hyenas. But these hyenas would be killed after the fourth attack. Merely two months after the killing of these hyenas, the killer struck again. And the last victim was the girl who was taken, who was sleeping next to her two brothers. Now, a lot of people had their doubts about whether this killer was an animal at all. Now, the reason they had their doubts was because of a bunch of reasons. They felt that the killer was not an animal, but a man. And they had their suspicions on tantrics. Now, there was a town very close to Paugad, which had practicing tantrics. Tantrics were black magicians, and they were known for conducting human sacrifices. Now, the reason people believed this was because all the victims were girls. All the girls were five years old or below. And all of them were the only daughters of their family. What's more, they also found a neatly severed leg of one of the victims. And the way the remains were found were completely inconsistent with the ways that hyenas feed. Which is why they believed that this was not the work of an animal. To this day, nobody knows what happened in those months of 1983 in Paugad. Whether the killer was human, whether it was animal, or whether it was more than human, no one can say. All that we know for certain is the dread and tragic sense of loss that it left in its wake. And those are the five stories that we have from this episode. I hope you enjoyed them. If you did, then please leave a like and a comment. And let me know what other stories you would like me to cover, especially spooky stories from your state if it's not been covered in this episode. We'll probably be doing one more or maybe a few more of these. So please put in any suggestions that you have in the comment section below. And until next time, take care and bye-bye.